Hello. Um, thanks, Jin, for the wonderful introduction. This is weird. Like, good Jesus, there's a lot of you in here. <laughs> and you're packed in here. Uh, this is fantastic. So thank you for all coming here today. Um, I'll, anybody who knows me, you probably know that I'm a pretty big rap fan. So in the words of my man, Jay-Z, you could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with me, and I appreciate that. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, I really do. And being, on, being here on the stage means a lot for me a lot to me for a lot of different reasons. Um, one, as Jen alluded to, uh, I gotta remember to speak into this thing, uh, is that um, I'm a, I've been a volunteer here with Creative Mornings for a little while now. So having the opportunity to be on stage and to talk to this crowd means a, a hell of a lot to me. Um, I've always felt like volunteering here was, a, in a little way, one way that I could give back to the, the design and creative community here. So uh, that's really special to me. Uh, I can still remember the very first one I went to, which was Will Miller back in September of 2013. And he's kind of the catalyst for how this whole lettering thing started for me. But I'll kind of talk about that a little later. Uh, the second is this is my first time giving a talk to a Chicago crowd. So this feels really, really special. Because um, you have the, the friends and the coworkers and the um, um, colleagues that you've worked with who supported you every step of the way. So I see so many of them here, which is great. Like I see a whole line of people in like the third row that I actually worked with, and that feels special. And my best friend Vince is back there in the back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very special feeling to do it in front of people you know. Uh, so thank you guys for, for having me. Um, so enough with the sappy stuff. We'll, we'll get to the talk. Uh, this month's theme is craft. And I have to admit, when I first got the, uh, the invitation to speak, I was kind of taken aback a bit. Um, I wasn't sure how I felt about it. My first reaction was, I'm an artist, right? Um, I don't do crafts. I don't knit. I don't make things out of mason jars. I don't melt crayons on a canvas, <laughs> right? Like, that's what we kind of think of when we first uh, think of the word craft. And I want to stop for a second and say, no offense. Uh, <laughs> it's not meant to offend anyone who does any of those things. I know a lot of people who do. Uh, a big part of me that a lot of people don't know is my mom got me into cross-stitching at a really, really young age. So I cross-stitched a lot. So I was a part of that group. It's just, it's a little bit different um, when you've gone to a, a university for art, right? I've spent tens of thousands of, tens of, thousands of dollars on a degree. Um, and art. And in art school, those are the things that they kind of teach you to avoid, right? They try, they try to get you to do things that are a little more creative, um, a little less common, a little less kish. So uh, my thought is, wouldn't it be better for them to have someone who does something that's slightly more relatable? Uh, maybe something that's more crafty. Uh, we all kind of have an idea of what a craft is and what an art is. Um, but before turning down that opportunity, because you never really turn down opportunities to speak. If you know me, I like to talk. And so 30 minutes to talk with no one interrupting me, I'm going to see if I can do it. Um, so I decided to do a little research. And by research, I mean I just Googled. Uh, <laughs> I did a quick Google search of the word craft. And what I came to realize is that I've been just sort of brainwashed to think that a craft was something different than art. It's really not, right? Um, when I looked it up, I realized that a craft was simply a skill in making or executing. Uh, it was an art, a trade, an occupation requiring a skill. It could be any skill. When I read that definition, I realized that what I can do, what I do, is still considered a craft in a lot of ways. Uh, there weren't really in, any limitations to the word and to what, it, what you uh, had to, to do in order to be considered a craftsperson. Um, uh, whoops, sorry. None of them were any better or worse than what I did on a daily basis. So I decided that maybe there was something that I could talk here about with you guys. Uh, so here's my talk today, and it's called Creating Your Own Craft. Uh, I think that there's a difference, a difference for me. I know a common term we hear and we think about is mastering your craft. I think mastery of craft is, is much different. It's like a lifetime worth of work. Um, but I think creating your craft is something that we can all do now, something we can start today uh, to begin to build on. So um, it's something I'm still working for, or working towards, and um, I'm continuing to work at it every single day. So. Uh, as many of you guys know, I'm an art director, designer, and letterer. 
Uh, the word letterer still feels weird to say. I, it's not even a real word, I don't think. It's like an extra ER. Uh, I know some people go lettering artist, but I didn't have time to spell out the whole thing. Uh, <laughs> I know this screen is super hard to see, especially for everyone over here. Good news is this talk does not have a lot of work in it. It's actually on purpose. Um, but this is, uh, my work kind of looks a lot like this. There's a lot of different, there's a lot of variation of slides from my two year anniversary cake that I iced, which is way harder than I ever expect. So mad prop to anybody who works in a bakery at a grocery store and has to do some crazy ass names on there. So uh, those are definitely crafts people. I, they're more of a crafts person than I am. They should be on stage today. Uh, but there's a couple of different pieces in there from collaboration I did with Nike and the coffee piece up the top uh, that I did with the previous agency, Weber Shanwick. So getting the chance to see a little bit of variation in my work. Or sometimes it looks like this, which once again, uh, more lettering pieces for garments, uh, stickers, writing on objects, making type out of objects, which is the s'more image at the bottom right, uh, which is made out of crushed graham crackers. Or sometimes this, which is just more, uh, right? Another. This uh, Nikki's hand, um, Nikki's in here somewhere, but there she is. That's her hand in the top of the sea holding the bowl of granola as a project that we worked on together. The rep and pins are down there. Thanks, Francis, for making it happen. That was awesome. Um, and I love to create things with my hands. I'm lucky that I get to do it most days um, when I'm not emailing and sending out invoices and all that kind of pesky administrative stuff. Um, so from sketching letter forms, so uh, these are a lot of sketch pieces to some of the work that I do. Like I said, I know it's hard to see for a lot of you guys, but they're just sketches. They're not that impressive. Don't worry. <laughs> um, to painting or rearranging them with flowers. So this is a piece that I just finished working on um, about two weeks ago for a, a, a prairie in Wisconsin. And it was to make a, a piece out of grass and leaves that they had at their prairie. So we had to like take a hike, find stuff, and then bring it back. Michelle, who was a former student of mine, is in here somewhere. And she helped me, or helped pick a lot of this stuff. So thank you, Michelle. Uh, so my craft allows me to build the things I love. But it didn't happen by accident, and it damn sure didn't happen overnight. right? Like These are a lot of the pieces that I worked on. These are a lot of the floral pieces I worked on. I have this real love for floral. I have a floral earring now, floral shirts. It's like my thing. I'm not, I'm not wearing one today, so I feel like a sellout. But uh, it's, it's definitely a part of my DNA. Um, like I said, it didn't happen overnight. It just happened by me taking the time to develop something that I saw potential in. It happened because I found a way to build a craft, uh, and I found a certain process that I wanted to share with y'all. And so for me, it's broken down into three steps. The first step is to define whatever your craft is, right? Um, it sounds really, really simple, but it's often one of the hardest things to do. Uh, you simply have to define what you want to be good at. And the key there is the want to. It's not what you're actually good at right now. You might be good at something now, but that's not what you want to be good at. Um, there are some people in this world and in this room who have really known what they want to be their entire life, right? Maybe they liked art as a kid or liked to draw, and they knew that their path would be defined by illustration. Maybe like they loved the sound of music, and they knew, they knew that playing an instrument was like their path to success, their path to happiness. Um, but some people had no clue what they wanted to do and had to kind of stumble through life in order to figure it out. And then others, like myself, kind of had it wrong in the beginning and had to struggle to redefine it uh, a little bit later in their lives. So not everyone knows this, but I never took an art class in high school. Um, I, I had absolutely no passion for art. I mean, like we've all taken art classes, I think, in like elementary school, maybe middle school. But after that, you kind of get to choose what you want to do. I did not think art was what I wanted to do, like a bunch of kids painting with aprons and shit on. I was like, that's not me. I'm like way too cool for that. Uh, <laughs> I knew that I wanted to be an engineer. My dad was an engineer, and it kind of led me down this path to, I got to have some water, sorry guys. Led me down this path to uh, be an engineer. So I went to college as a civil engineering major. And about a year into the program or so, uh, something just didn't feel right. I realized that I had trouble kind of envisioning myself as uh, a, a full-time engineer, sitting in the desk and like a cubicle, and everything's beige and wearing khakis. Like I was like, nah, that's not me either. <laughs> So, <laughs> nothing wrong with wearing khakis. <laughs> uh, <laughs> after failing a few classes, I, and by I, I mean mainly my advisor, uh, told me that engineering wasn't for me. Once you get a certain GPA, they're pretty much like, yeah, you're not, you're not going to continue <laughs> with this anymore. So I had to have a really awkward, awkward conversation to tell my parents that I didn't want to be an engineer anymore. They said no, right? Like, 
they, uh, they had my best intentions in mind, I think, at the very beginning. Uh, my mom and my dad were very supportive, and they still are to this day, to everything that I do. But um, when I was a little bit younger, I had a problem a lot of times with just quitting things maybe a little too early, right? Like not sticking through and seeing if it wasn't what I really wanted to do or was. Um, so they, they told me, don't quit just because it's hard. Give it another try. Like, keep going. Let's see if it's really not for you. And that's, if it's not, then we'll figure it out. So uh, after making a lot of real bad grades, I mean, I'm talking like, I was academic probation for a little while in college. So uh, it took a while. I graduated with a 3.0, which like, amazed me because I had an under one after my freshman year. So it was a big buildup. Art school, it'll help your GPA if you're looking. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I stayed around, like I said, for another semester and continued taking uh, some engineering classes. But I realized that my interest was totally gone in that. Uh, and this time I knew it was for good. So I spent a semester just like trying to figure shit out. Uh, like, everyone has that like discovery phase. Some people take a year off of school to figure it out. I just decided to pay a couple thousand dollars to figure it out. <laughs> it works too. Uh, but somehow I ended up in a drawing class, and I really do not know how it happened. It's funny because today's rules at my university uh, require you to submit a portfolio to get into even a single art class. So before I was before that, you could just like just take a random art class. You can have a business major in a drawing class for no damn reason. I was the engineering major in an art class for no damn reason. Um, but something kind of clicked there. I was really bad at it, but I, I kind of had this idea uh, that I was I could be good at this. Um, so I kind of had to have that awkward conversation again with my parents. Said I don't want to be an engineer anymore. I want to major in art. Uh, and this time their response was a little bit different. And it was to just tell me to give it, their, give it my all. Also, these are like very iPhone speech bubbles. I didn't have an iPhone at that time. So uh, it was definitely T9 on that type board. You know, I was, I was a pro with that. Uh, my parents were very supportive. They knew, they, they weren't sure what this career would lead for for me, but they knew, like, I have a lot of passion for a lot of different things. And like, if you tell me I can't do it, like, I'm all about trying and proving you wrong to, to prove that I can. Um, but so they knew it was something I was totally capable, capable of, and they knew that I would make the best of whatever it was. So um, I guess I did, because I'm standing here in front of all you guys. I at least made it somewhere. Um, so you might be wondering, why am I even telling you this story? Uh, and it's because people often see the work that I do and just think that it's some incredible innate skill that I was like gifted with from birth, right? Like I was just groomed for this. I was like a young Tiger Woods just sliding in there, like hidden out of the bunker. I, I wasn't. Um, they assume that I've always been an artist, which as I told you before, is not the case. They assume that I've always been creative, which once again, not the case. Or at the very least, they've assumed that I've always just had good handwriting. And I don't know if you guys know this, but this whole presentation is done in my handwriting. That's how shitty it is, all right? Like, I had to struggle to make sure you guys could actually read this thing. Um, so I'm telling you this because uh, people struggle to find out they're, what they're good at without realizing that sometimes it just finds you. I didn't go searching for my purpose really in that, that one semester of classes. I didn't purposely go take an art class because I thought I might like it. I just took an art class because I needed 12 credit hours and it just kind of clicked and I became a designer. I became, a, became an art major. Um, but your craft isn't always the calling that you thought you had, but you have to be open-minded enough to, to see it when, it when the opportunity presents itself. Uh, and you have to be willing to give it a chance. But that's quite, not quite enough. So finding what you're good at or what you want to be good at isn't enough to just simply call it your craft. Uh, the next step is to actually develop it. Uh, and whew, I actually have a little slide messed up, don't I? So in the words of Kanye West, sorry, I'm going to skip a slide and go for it. Um, that's right, you got to put in work, move your ass, go berserk. Granted, it's from the new workout plan, which is a totally different, like, it's a different meaning and then an extra different meaning that we're talking about here. If you know the song, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, but sorry, step two is to develop it. That was a little slide mess up. Um, you have to put in the work to make yourself better at it. You have to go to school or you have to take workshops or you have to simply practice in your spare time to get better at the things that you want to get better at, get better at whatever that craft is. Uh, you have to do something that works those creative muscles to make them stronger. Mastering your craft takes practice and lots of it. Um, and although people say that, a lot of people say that practice makes perfect and they like to letter it and put it over a photo and Instagram it to get likes, uh, I don't think that practice actually makes perfect. It just makes things easier. Uh, it makes it so you can spot the flaws in your work as well as other people's works a, uh, a little bit uh, quicker. It helps you address your, the problems in your own pieces in future iterations. 
you have to keep creating the things that you want to be good at and like put yourself on some sort of a deadline. I know that the Ira Glass um, talk where he talks about putting yourself on a deadline to produce works by a certain amount of time makes you better. Um, I, had, I went through the same kind of thing, forcing myself to always do work and always be putting things out there. And I still do that to this day to keep me honest. Um, whether it's through cl uh, client projects or simple daily personal projects, you have to force yourself to be creative, especially in the beginning or especially in trying something new. Um, because remember that our minds, our creative talents, whatever is up here, it's just like our muscles, just like our physical ones, right? Every time we go to the gym, we make it a little bit stronger. And we have to remember that it's like if you've ever taken if you've ever taken two weeks off of the gym, going back like feels like the worst possible uh, experience, right? So if you've never done something before, if you've never been to the gym, the first time you go is like the worst, right? You, you feel horrible the next day, and you feel horrible while you're there. It's the same kind of thing goes on when you're doing things that are mental too, even with your creative talents. The first time you do something, the first time you try to paint, you're gonna suck at it. Uh, but it's this idea that the more that you paint, the better you get at it, the better those creative muscles get, uh, the stronger you get. So uh, this all kind of started with me with a simple daily project, and it was called a word a day, you know, like a word a day. Uh, you know, like, I try to use that as much as possible in the a, a day, and it always happens like meetings, Emily shaking her head at me. Uh, no, clearly not. It's a really lame joke, but I think it works. It cuts the, it like breaks the ice a little bit when you need it. Um, like I said, as I mentioned before, I kind of stumbled into my career as a designer, and also kind of stumbled into my career as a lettering artist. Uh, it all kind of started with this personal illustration that I did. It was a, of a Day of the Dead skull. Because uh, I was just kind of, at the time, just not uh, super inspired by what I was doing on a day-to-day -day -day basis. So I did an illustration, and I put it on a website called Cotton Bureau, where they, they pay for all the upfront costs of printing, and you get like a percentage of the sale, a dollar amount of each sale. Uh, it was just for fun, and I was just like, whatever, maybe a couple people will buy it, I'll make like 10 bucks, right? Like, I'll be happy. Uh, but I ended up selling a ton of them, uh, and actually getting a lot of money back for it. So I told myself before I, I even put it on sale that every dollar I made, I would spend on art, art supplies. So when I got a whole lot of money, I was like, okay, I gotta figure out what to do with it. What's the most expensive thing you can buy at Blick? Painting stuff and like brush pens. They get real expensive for some random ass reason. <laughs> Kyle is shaking his head back there. He knows, he gets it. Uh. And it was, at the time, I was working a full-time job, and I was less than six months into that job, so I wasn't paying student loans back yet. So I was like playing with house money. It was like free money, like whatever you want to do with it, spend it, have fun, uh, and uh, see what happened. So it, uh, I decided that I would take these lettering tools, these brush pens, and all this, this fancy vellum and trays and paper that I bought, uh, and try to put it to good use. So I gave myself a simple daily project. And what's funny is it all kind of was inspired by my first Creative Mornings talk with Will Miller. Uh, I wanted to pursue lettering. I kind of had an idea about it. But then I talked to him, and we talked about experimenting with new tools, and it led down this path of creating stuff. So the idea of the project was to do one word every single day um, that was kind of based on how I was feeling or whatever, just a random word. So on days like this, I was probably really frustrated. <laughs> Or on days like this, feeling pretty happy, apparently. And on days like this, I might have been going on a date that night. Who knows? Uh, like the, the point of the word itself, uh, the point wasn't the word itself. The idea was the dedication I had to have to it, right? Um, these are all the like, parts of them. There were 30 of them. I did them every day. 31, sorry. I did every day for the month of October. Uh, so these are all, to me, just horrible. But they were, it, to me, it was a start. It was a start of something new. It was playing with a new tool every single time. Some are digital, some are just scanned right in and thrown over a photo. It was, you know, throwing it over a photo is a way to like, increase your likes by like 10 times. <laughs> so when you're at the beginning, I was like, yo, let me put it over a photo. Let me see what I can get out of this. Um, but it was, it was uh, the idea to be committed to this. Um, it was, I was so committed that I had a friend who came to visit from North Carolina uh, in the middle of October. and. I, the three days she was here, every day I would force us to go back to my apartment during the middle of the day so I could actually do the word and then go back out. So we would always like try to eat and booze way too much for brunch. And then we're like, you know, you got to go take a nap before you can keep going. And then I would do my lettering piece and then continue going. Um, but like I said, this got me to do more and more work, got me putting it out there. Uh, eventually it led me to doing more lettering work and then even more and then picking up jobs for it. And now I'm at the place where I can say that I'm making a career out, career out of it. Um, not only did it force me to create more in order to find my craft, it forced me to just put it out there. Uh, and that is step three, is to share it. To share what you've been making and the things that you've learned on your journey to get there. Uh, you share them because you feel like you have to and because you feel like it's the best thing for you, right? 
Um, but not only is it the best thing for you to share it, to put it out there, it's also best for the people who are watching, who are observing, everyone around. Um, no matter if it's a kid or your peer, right? Like we, we see these things around us that always continue to inspire us. Um, sharing, sharing tips and sharing things to the world and the world sharing it back is the way that we learn um, and the way that we, we continue to get better in whatever, we're, whatever it is that we're doing. For me, sharing takes... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was, that was a very inside joke with, with uh, Vince. There's a comedian who, every time he says, for me, he goes, for me. And Vince and I joke about it all the time. And I told him I was going to say it and try not to laugh. And damn it, I laughed. Sorry. Oh, man. For, for me, this takes on a couple of different forms. The first is sharing your insecurities <laughs> um, and sharing uh, personal pieces and simply putting them out there for the world to see. So I do these. I do a lot of things uh, you'll see on social media, on Instagram, and even on my website. I do them just for myself, right? I create something because it feels good to me. Um, but maybe just doing it for myself inspires other people to put their own work out there. Uh, maybe it makes them less afraid when I post something about my own securities, insecurities and my own flaws in my work. Uh, maybe it gives them something to try to top, which is a great feeling. Like every, I know every time I talk with Kyle a lot about uh, our work, and I always feel like you know, when I look at what he's done, I'm always trying to like top it. I'm trying to better it. And I like this feeling of, it, of uh, always working with someone else or always looking at other people's work. Just try to make your work even better. The second way that um, I share what I do and share my craft is through sharing techniques. Uh, and sharing some of the tips and the behind the scenes, behind the way that things are made, right? Um, the way that I learned to digitize my lettering was from the tips of another designer, Neil Secretario. He's an amazing lettering artist. Um, but he would post these exquisite letter, letter forms on his Instagram, and he would highlight all of the anchor points in the Bezier curve, and he would post them. And so I would just simply copy his work. I would just take screenshots of it and pop in Illustrator and copy it. What I realized is that he, or what I knew, is that he not only had the beauty in each letter, but he also had the structure of each letter. He had both of them taken care of. He'd already made something that looked really good, and he showed me how to do it. So I would just trace it, because I, at that point, was, was trying to learn, still developing my lettering skill, but trying to develop a new skill. So what I, when, by tracing his work, I realized that I didn't have to worry about making it beautiful. I just had to worry about making it technically sound, which becomes a lot more easy, or a lot easier, right? It's like this idea of if you're, if you're just learning to draw or just learning to paint, you don't paint things a lot of times out of your head or, or out of memory. You look at a still life. You just try to copy it. Um, I never shared any of those things because I couldn't. They're not mine. They're not my work. They're always his work. But for me, that was just a great way to practice. Um, and here's a, other pieces that um, Neil has shared. I just wanted to share a couple of them. Like th these are actual pieces that I've traced. I mean, like, I think the date, yeah, 2014. So that was a year after me like starting into lettering. Um, whew, sorry. Um, so now I'm uh, actually really lucky that I can share versions of, my, of the same thing, the same things with the people who follow me uh, and who, are, who look at my work to try to learn it for themselves. So I like to post a lot of Bezier shots, so this very technical process that I use, um, because I know that somebody out there wants to learn how to do it. I get people who uh, DM me all the time, like trying to get a better grip of this. And my first suggestion is to, just to try to copy one of these. Put their anchor points in that exact place, drag your handles to the exact same spots, and make sure you can replicate the exact same thing. Then this idea gets a little easier. So, I like to think that I have figured out the beauty as well. Maybe I haven't. Maybe you guys all disagree. Uh, but the technical side is there for people to observe, right? You can stop worrying about the, the letter forms themselves and about creating a piece. And you can worry about trying to place your anchor points in a certain place to make you uh, a better technical person when it comes to digitizing your lettering. And the third way is to share knowledge. So. The third form of this is sharing everything I've learned. And I've been super lucky. Somehow, I got the opportunity to teach lettering and typography at DePaul University. Um, I get to teach lettering and typography to a bunch of undergrads who don't look that much younger than I am. Or, and they are. Like, I look at this photo, and I'm like, who the fuck is the teacher, right? Like, <laughs> the only thing that separates me is maybe I have my, my shirt buttoned all the way to the top. Otherwise. <laughs> Sometimes I would come to campus in like my little red backpack and like a t-shirt, and I was like, yo, I feel like I'm 16. And uh, whew, I had to grow some facial hair a little bit, just to like try to elevate myself, get myself like a step away from them. Uh, 
But teaching is good because it forces me to share my craft in a new way. It forces me to not only explain what it is I do, but to evaluate it differently, to be able to explain it to them, right? Like to evaluate their work. So this is from my typography class. And at the beginning, we, I forced them to just draw letter forms. They look at a specimen sheet of tiny type and have to replicate it at a larger scale uh, without tracing it. So it's this idea like they have to focus in on it a little bit. This is uh, Michelle, she's over there in the corner. This is her work that we worked with. Uh, I was actually inspired by Kyle piece, Kyle Latender's piece. Uh, I, I can't, I can't. I gotta take it off of me and put it on you. Um, and it's a lettering piece that we worked through together. So it was this, it, the idea of not only evaluate my own work, because sometimes we get caught up in the things that we create, but it's easier to start to spot flaws when you look at other people's work. Um, and then this last photo, I just threw this one in. This is from, this is Will, he was in my class. This is our final project, which was like doing a lettering piece for a food spread. Uh, he is in full costume as a cowboy because this was Halloween and I told anybody who dressed up in costume that they would get extra credit. So <laughs> students would do almost anything you tell them, which is great, like I get a like, total power over these guys. <laughs> But I think that teaching it to others, uh, teaching others what you've learned is the only way to develop whatever your craft is. It helps you to understand that your way might have some flaws. Uh, there was a big moment when I was trying to teach the Bezier process, the way to digitize, to this class. And some people got it right away. But there are a lot of people who struggled with it. And I had to realize that the way that I told it, the way that I taught it, was maybe a little incorrect. Right? I had to like start at a different level. I had to maybe go back a step and make sure they understood the first step before they could understand the next one. So we forget that we're caught. Like, I already knew how to use Illustrator, but maybe some students don't as well. So I need to actually take a step back, teach them the tool, and then teach them the way into using the tool. Uh, it helps you to, under, like I said, you're, understand that there's some flaws in everything that you do and all of your work. And it forces you to critically analyze your process uh, in order to explain it. So uh, it, most importantly, it requires you to give that knowledge that you gained back out to the world. Um, our knowledge just doesn't just belong to us. It belongs to everyone. Um, and I feel like failing to share those things is the most selfish way to live. So I always talk about investing in, into your craft means investing into others who are also into your craft. Right? Um, our time is not redeemable. It's the only thing that we can't get back. We can give, we can give out products. We can give out things. We can give out money. And it's, it may be difficult, but you can always make those things back. We can never get back this time. So this time that you spend with a student to help them develop, or this time that you spend with a mentee to help them get better, uh, you can never get that time back. So I think that investing into this is the ultimate sacrifice. Whether that's teaching at a university to a group of undergrads for a very small paycheck, because I'm going to tell you, as an adjunct, you don't get paid that much. It's not that glamorous. Um, or if it's just teaching to a friend who wants to learn to do what you do, just because it feels right. Giving your time and knowledge is the only way to show how invested you truly are in whatever your craft is. So share, because life's a hell of a lot more fun when you help others to make their path a little easier. Right? It's like if we can help anyone make like, an easier path to anything, it always feels good to ourselves. Right? And it not only feels good to us, but it feels good to them. So if we can help people not go through those same stumbling blocks and roadblocks that we had as we were uh, learning things or creating something new, uh, the easier and the better things um, will be. So whatever it is that you choose to want to master, or whatever it is that chooses you, remember first that you have to define it. Then you have to develop it. And lastly, you have to be willing to share it. You have to be willing to give it out. Um, I don't know it all, and I never will. But I enjoy the process of, of creating my own craft, uh, getting better at the little things every single day, those little tiny details. Uh, yes, I am a letterer, but I know that my way will never be the same as anyone else's. It will never be the same process. It will never be the same exact technique. Uh, so my craft is special to me, and I'm just so glad that you guys gave me the opportunity to share it uh, with you all. So thank you. Thank you.